Good evening. I call this Iowa City Community School Board meeting on Tuesday, July 10th, 2018 to order. My name is Janet Godwin and I want to thank those in the audience, those watching on television and those following on Twitter for joining us tonight. I'll start by introducing those at the table with me. To my right, Superintendent Steve Murley, Directors Rathina Malone, Phil Hemingway, Lori Rotland, J.P. Clausen, Sean Eystone, Paul Ressler, and, and Kim Colvin, our recording secretary. The public is reminded that if they wish to speak, they need to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in. During community comment, persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda items and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. Before starting on community comment, I want to thank Betsy for the cookies. Thank you. It's just what we needed tonight, sustenance. And we will start community comment um, with you. You're up first. Um, and following Betsy, we've got Denise Dickel. Is this on? Mm -hmm. It's on? You can hear yes. it? Oh, great. Hi, I'm Betsy Miller. I'm the co-president of Sears from here to for Hoover. So I'm, we're back. Hoover's back. Anyway, I just wanted to, we're getting a lot of parents um, asking us if we've heard about the boundaries, and we heard that they're redoing the boundaries for Hoover kids again, and I, I'm here to remind you that we're working with kind of a, a sensitive subject for Hoover people anyway, and we're working with the under 12 population. So these are kids who are going to lose their school. Some of them don't know where they're going to go next year. And we want to create liaisons to the schools that they are going to. We want to create like a healthy transition. And we need to know, at least for Hoover, the Hoover kids, what the boundaries are going to be. And I'm requesting that, if that can be. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, if you need help, our help. We have, we have savvy people in our school that maybe could help. I don't know. But um, that's about it. That's all I have. I don't know, Julie, our co-president here. Julie, do you have anything? Okay. Oh, sure. Whatever's like to add is just, uh, we've already gone through a lot of changes. We've already had to tell our kids the last couple of years, we went through this process two years ago of what the boundaries were gonna be. So we've done a lot of talking at the school, of like, oh, this is where your kids are going. And now knowing that we may not have a final decision till December, it's just going to add some extra stress to the students and the families that want to start preparing for where we're going next. And like Betsy said, we really want to be able to add, have some programs at the school where we're talking with the other schools, we're bringing in those principals, where we're getting the kids connected, the PTAs connected, just to help make the transition as easy as possible. So we just would hope you take that into consideration with your decisions when you're going to do the Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And thanks for your service. Thanks. Uh, Denise. Thank you. So, my name is Denise Deckel. I'm a past old parent of children in the city school district. I'm just passing out more reports studies, bibliography sources in regards to the LGBTQ proposed curriculum. And that's all I'm going to say about it. You guys are more intelligent than I am. You can read it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure I just want to thank you for all the time and the research and the listening that you've already done and studying that you've already done on this issue. And you care about kids, obviously, or you wouldn't be up here. Um, and I just want to thank you for your service to our community and concerning safety for all children. Thank you, Denise. Um, up next, Eric Johnson. Don't worry, I'm not going to try to read all of this. Um, Eric Johnson, 1630 Ridge Street, Iowa City, Iowa. Um, I've got a child just leaving Twain and just going into Southeast. And uh, I do some work in some uh, 
volunteer organizations, but I want to make it clear that what I'm saying up here, I'm just representing myself and my own opinion as a parent and a member of the community. So I attended the board retreat a few weeks ago, and I was struck by something. When the discussion of board norms began, and I'm just reading this because I'm hopeless if I try to wing it. Um, President Godwin indicated that there had been a breach of board code, policy, and board norms by a member of the board. And this seems pretty serious. Interesting, interestingly enough, though, even though I stayed in the room for the whole discussion without ever hearing which board member it was who committed this breach, or just what the violation of the rules, uh, violation of the rules had taken place, um, I'm now pretty sure I know what took place, but only because of a Freedom of Information Act request. And since the board avoided making these details public during the retreat, I wanted to uh, state them here so that there's some kind of official record. Apparently, Director Hemingway has been regularly and secretly forwarding internal board and, and administration emails, including internal board communications, emails to the board from community members, and confidential personnel information to a local reporter. I can't speak for Director Hemingway's intentions, but looking at what was forwarded, I'd speculate that most of it seems selectively chosen to support his criticisms of the administration and the superintendent and perhaps other board members. Given that Director Hemingway has had numerous editorials published in the local paper and has a public forum to voice his mind on these topics every other Tuesday and sits on a board that wields authority over the superintendent and administration, this seems like a questionable path to pursue at best. Now, some of this material I recovered suggests poor judgment and certainly violates the spirit of board norms, but likely doesn't rise to violating code or policy. For instance, here we have an email crowing about working closely with the Iowa Republican Party, which, as most of you probably know, has done a great deal of work to defund public schools across the state and pass laws stripping teachers of their collective bargaining rights. Or here, where Director Hemingway received a question and an outline of a story from a different reporter, one who works for a local newspaper, and immediately forwarded that email to the reporter he'd sent all of this other information to. Were I the reporter who sent this email? Uh, I don't think I'd appreciate that very much. Or here, where Director Hemingway received a question, oh wait, sorry, I did that. Or here, where he first circulated a board press release about an award the district received, to friends via email, and then forwarded that chain, complete with his friend's snarky comments about the award, to his chosen news source. And just to note, uh, other emails show Director Hemingway regularly sharing emails sent to the board by parents and community members with his friends and political supporters. As someone who's sent a good deal of email to this board, I'm not certain I appreciate that. But the real concern and the real violation of board code and policy seems to be the sharing of legally confidential information related to internal personnel matters. For instance, this is an email likely sent by a parent or community member. We don't know who wrote it or what it said because its contents were sensitive enough that it was entirely redacted when released under the Freedom of Information Act request. But it wasn't redacted when Director Hemingway forwarded it to his personal news outlet. And here, we have an email that Director Godwin forwarded to the rest of the board from the district's chief human resources officer. The original email was entirely redacted when included with this FOIA request. Director Godwin's note says, FYI, do not forward or reply all. Director Hemingway immediately forwarded this, unredacted, to his pet news source. And lastly, here, uh, Director Godwin... I'm sorry, Eric, your time is up. I apologize. I've been trying very hard to keep to our four-minute um, I was, four I was minute trying to limit. work through it very quickly. I think I got the gist across. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. That concludes community comment this evening. Um, we'll move to the agenda approval. Um, is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Rotland, Ressler, Godwin, Clausen, Malone, and I Stone voting yay and Director Hemingway voting nay. Okay, thank you. Next up is the consent agenda. Phil, would you like to give an update on the bills this month or this pay period? Yes.
Okay, we had uh, $6.7 million worth of spending. $2.1 million came out of uh, the GO bond. Uh, we also had a annual payment to Mercer Park for $120,000 and uh, 120560 for a pool agreement. Um, also, uh, we utilized uh, prison uh, labor uh, to uh, move uh, materials from Lincoln and Mann uh, for $5,107, which um, I wish we could make an opportunity for our students to uh, make some summer money by doing that, but I'm not opposed to giving people second chances. Um, also, there was uh, uh, $22,859 for administrative uh, licenses that we uh, paid out of the general fund. I understand it's in their contracts, but our teachers pay for their own licensing out of their own money, and I think at some point in time we should have a discussion to see if administrators could pay for their own licensing since our uh, other staff do so. But uh, all questions I had were answered by staff and everything looks in order. Thank you. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Rotland, Ressler, Godwin, Clausen, Malone, and Eyestone voting yay and director Hemingway voting nay. Thank you, Lisa. So this is uh, just was scheduled to be one of my quarterly updates, which I wanted to say that I very much appreciate the opportunity um, to be in front of you four times this year. Um, hopefully that's something that's appealing to all of you to go um, forward into next year with too, because I feel like um, this way, you know, w w communication is one of the things that we're working on in the department, which you'll hear more about in a minute, but, um, and this is just one good venue to get um, information out. So that's um, been very much appreciated. So tonight I wanna to talk about the, um, the district developed service delivery plan work. Um, and just kind of a recap, and I know when this process kind of started, some of you maybe weren't even on the school board yet, and there are probably um, some people out there in the public that don't quite understand the series of, the long series of events that have kind of come um, gone by here, so I'm going to just briefly go back over that again. Um, but due to the, the brevity of this time given here, I'm just really trying to share key findings of the work underway um, so far regarding the plan, and we'll have updates for you as we go. So reminder, um, last fall when I first arrived here in Iowa City, um, the, done, the work had already been done to update the special educate, the district developed service delivery plan for the district, um, which is a plan that every district is required to have. Um, and back um, when we were under corrective actions, that was one of the things that was ordered to be done, um, which we would have had to do eventually anyway. So that process was just kind of sped up a little bit and kind of under a tighter timeline than normal. So by the time I got here, that was all done, ready to be recommended, so I did recommend it. Um, but at the time, the uh, board requested additional communication um, because as was required by the planning process, the um, plan at that time was put up for public review on the website, which it's absolutely supposed to be, um, but we didn't receive any public comments back from it. Um, so during the month when it was up, either nobody had looked at it or nobody had responded to it. So 
At that point, um, the board insightfully asked that we, could we mail the plan home to parents, which we did do, um, and then also put it up for additional time, which, which we did do. So as a result of that, we got some comments back that made us think that we kind of had a reason to go back at the planning process again. Um, so we, you know, try to decide how to, how to best do that. There is kind of a minimal process required here in Iowa um, that involves just a planning committee with certain membership on it and, um, and then that public comment, but we just really felt like that process wasn't sufficient for us, um, that we wanted more input and, you know, maybe a, a wider um, body of information to be able to inform our work for the planning process. Um, so we spent the spring, um, so that's when we decided to contra contract with our Grantwood AEA partners um, to employ Beth Steenwick to come and help us through the process of gathering a very wide body of information and then using it to inform our work. So we spent the spring, um, we spent the spring gathering more information and the way that we did that was through three different processes. Um, and it was really kind of meant to, to capture a very wide body of information and then funnel that down. Um, and then use, up, use what, um, a, a wide variety of responses and more detailed information to go back to our district level committees with um, to eventually put the required plan together um, but then also guide our, just our, our wider scale planning around just the work that we want to do in the department. Um, and also communication plan, um, which will be part of it, a formal communication plan will be one of the results of all of this work. Um, but especially with the communication, it's important to know what meets the needs of the people that you're communicating with. Um, and that the communication isn't a one way street. Um, how can, you know, com real communication is exchange of information. So we don't want to just give information, we also want to, we want to um, set up feedback loops. So in order to get information um, that we could use in order to make a good plan that would meet the needs of the, the um, community, parents, uh, staff, and so forth, we have been using this information, um, which was organized into survey, phone interview, and focus groups. I think that's where I left off with you last time. So just as a report back, um, the survey. It was open for a month and intended to collect a wide body of information, like I said. It was completely anonymous. And before we sent, what we were designing the survey, I just, I've met a few parents here who had mentioned to me at some point, hey, if you ever need anyone to bounce something off of, you know, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. So I, I thought, boy, you're, you might regret putting out that offer. <laughs> but so right away I did and tried to figure out, like the last survey that was done here in the district didn't seem to be very, um, special education survey didn't seem to be very well, well responded to. So, you know, trying to get an um, idea of why, why would that be and how can we make sure that we're, you know, getting a better response. Um, and one of the things that several people told me is that there, there really was a fear that the, the surveys and the information that they were giving w was not going to be anonymous. Um, and that somehow someone was going to be going over this information trying to retrieve and figure out who, who said, you know, certain comments um, about different staff members or, you know, so somehow there was a re uh, fear that they were going to be retaliated against. So we really, really took great caution in order to make sure that the survey absolutely is 100% anonymous and that people could feel safe that it was anonymous. So um, in order to get, you know, information about who wanted ongoing opportunities for input, we had to ask demographic and personal information about um, the respondents who were, who wanted to give that, um, but that was a whole separate process at the end of the survey that went to a completely different collection site. Mm -hmm. So um, what, and I also had a, a question from one of you about more specific information from the survey results, which we have posted to board docs. Um, and you can go in and it just, you know, tells detailed information about the different questions. But one thing we did not do is put, because there was a place to put um, personal comments, you know, just anecdotal comments in there. 
But looking at some of those, I can see that a way that parents would think, you know, this putting this out to the public is identifiable for me or my child or my school or my t child's teacher, whatever. So we did not do that. And the reason why is to honor the promise that we have made over and over and over for complete anonymity um, of the respondents. So, but all of the other um, information is available. And I'm not gonna go into that tonight because it's a large data set and you can look at it. So we had 205 parents of IP students, 282 parents of students without IEPs, 521 staff, 69 community, and a total of over 1,000 responses, uh, which we were really happy with. Um, and I keep on looking over here at Kristen because she helped us with, with the survey, and I, thought, I think that we were all pretty happy with that um, number of responses, and it gave us a lot of information to work with. Um, some people indicated Actually, 47 people indicated an interest in one or more of the um, ongoing options for um, additional input, and um, that would have been focus group, phone interview, or um, possibly later on the plan committee. We're going to add a few people to that committee later. So the phone interviews. Um, we had the phone interviews were um, uh, like a... a sort of like a narrative conversation. There were prompts that um, we came up with that the interviewers um, asked to parents and staff over the phone. So we wanted to make sure that these folks that were doing the interviewing were um, people that would not, would be seen as more imp impartial, that people wouldn't be shy of talking to. So we had um, some of our volunteer, some people that are volunteers are graduate students at the University of Iowa who volunteered to do this for us and one of the professors there from the education department that we commonly work with in special ed um, kind of organized their force. And then um, I also have an internship student who did this as part of her practicum hours. It's um, a teacher in the district. So um, we were really happy to be able to get that group of people so that we weren't calling here from ESC or you know somewhere trying to get people to you know open up to us. So. Um, those who indicated an interest in a phone interview were called and invited to arrange a time, and many of those folks either declined or arranged a time and then didn't answer. We had to have it transcribed so that we could get accurate um, responses, and so we had to call them, um, you know, using our electronic system that would transcribe it for us, and some people did not um, follow through with that. Which, which is okay with us. It was totally voluntary if they decided, you know, in the long run they didn't want to do it. We still had their, inter, their um, survey data. So we felt like some people after that maybe felt like, you know, they had given enough input or, or weren't comfortable with giving the interview after all or um, what have you. But that's, that's why we had 11. Focus groups um, were conducted by Beth Steenwick and um, some of our partners from Grantwood AEA were recording the um, responses that were given in the focus groups. Those who indicated an interest in participating in a focus group were all invited um, and some people declined. In fact, we, we had, you can see the numbers there of different people that we had um, come. But, we offered a couple of different sessions for each group. Um, there were a total of nine focus groups altogether. Um, this was held during the winter months, so, you know, I don't know, I don't remember there being terrible weather on either day, but it's, you know, harder to get people out. I'm not sure if that contributed to some people not wanting to come or exactly why, but, um, but we did feel like we mined a lot of really um, reflective information through the focus group process, um, even though we had a small, smaller number than we wanted, had hoped for. Um, we still got a lot of really good, useful information. So every single person who indicated an interest in ongoing opportunity for input um, through one of those other um, devices was invited um, and had an opportunity for additional input. Some, some folks will also be invited probably to add, like I said, to the plan team we're looking at demographic information to try to um, get our team maybe representative of some marginalized groups that we know we have a, a hard time getting um, 
input from and that sort of thing. So um, we'll do that after school starts. Our key takeaways, though, um, <clears throat> we've tried to, um, we organized a retreat with our district level support team, um, which would include instructional design strategists um, who all work out in, in buildings with um, coaching teachers. Some of them are teachers also. Um, also our lead teachers, assistant special ed directors, and me, um, a few of our Grantwood partners who work in our buildings, um, the Grantwood regional administrators, um, Beth Steenwick. So we had, we also had a volunteer who did a lot of trying to categorize themes within the um, data, a graduate student that just does some, that I've had the good, good fortune of finding to do some, um, just some volunteer things for me with data. So we took all of that and just put it in front of our team and tried to um, start to get some themes. You know, we, the, the thing that is important to know here is that we're just looking for commonalities across those, um, those different, uh, first of all, the group, the different groups, the staff, parents, community, so forth, then also in the different settings. Um, there were some definitely some themes that emerged um, and, and we have those here listed here. And those things will be um, used and a, a starting place for the, the next layer of work that we'll do, which is to bring more staff into the process um, of figuring out, you know, what are the areas of emphasis going to be in our ongoing work um, and continuous improvement. So we, um, so we will be, you know, just planning future direction. And I, I think it's really important to understand that, um, you know, it, this is something that we're going to have to inform you about as time goes on, because I really could sit, sit in my office and go through all the papers and decide, here's what our emphasis is. Um, but ongoing and continuous improvement should be something that happens with staff and not to them. Um, so it's really important to take the right amount of time to have the right conversations and um, getting people understanding and agreeing what, what our next step should be. Um, and we're never going to be done with that. We, it is a continuous improvement cycle. We're never really going to be, um, have arrived at the place where, where we want to be. We're always going to want to be looking at more and more information and, and continuing that process. Um, so just a couple of comments that kind of emerged in each of these areas. Um, service delivery. A few of the things that were mentioned is, uh, would be that students with disabilities learning Iowa Core in the least restrictive environment um, is a concern for that group. Um, staff really believing that all students can learn at high levels and collaboration available to make that happen. Um, administrators taking an active role in creating and maintaining a culture of student and teacher growth, um, which I loved hearing that. You know, I keep saying we're a learning organization. Um, we should expect for all of our staff and all of our students to be learning. We, they should have permission to learn. Um, so I think focusing on those growth, um, that growth culture across the district is just incredibly important. Um, professional learning, we, they said they wanted job embedded coaching focus. Um, use of more PD surveys and feedback to kind of guide their, um, you know, how their professional learning time is being used, and I know that's, that's one of the things that the, just the curriculum department did um, this year just with all staff training, and I've heard a lot of really positive things about that. Um, staff typically know what they need to learn and what they want and need to learn about, so the opportunity to have input into that is wonderful. Um, and then some unified gen ed special ed training, which we've also tried to do, get a start on that even this year, but we, there are a lot, lot more that we can do. Climate, culture, and leadership, um, creating a learning environment where we all work together to support staff and students, um, establishing a clear and consistent message among district support team. Um, a lot of our members, especially coming into this next year to that district support team that I just told you about, um, they're new. They're new people who are new to their positions. So this is perfect time to try to work on that messaging, the vision, establishing the vision continuing those conversations around how to get there um, when we go out and talk with staff. 
And then um, I, I really loved this, so I had to bring it. But become a respected district that serves all students well is what they said they wanted to do. Um, they want to be known for achieve, high levels of achievement with all students, not just some. Collaboration. Um, they want to identify the barriers to why we're not getting as much collaboration in time as we want and need um, per t to <laughs> establish a culture where we protect and value the collaboration time um, and then find better ways just to find times in the schedules. Um, and the scheduling is a real thing in schools. I mean, sometimes it just comes down to the nuts and bolts of there isn't enough time in the day. Um, so they want to get their mind around how, then how do we free some time up? We don't have more time, so how do we get it? Instruction, um, that we have a moral imperative to close the achievement gap, um, improve data analysis and collective accountability between gen ed and special ed for all kids. And then of course communication, um, correction of existing district documents. Um, sometimes we have conflicting documents um, out in different places, so we have been working on some of that already and we need, just need to continue. Um, better communicate the why. Um, you know, we did a lot of work with our team about why. Why are we doing this? Um, why do we even want to do this work? Why is it important? Who is it important to? Um, if it was your child that we're talking about, would it be important? Um, so, you know, going out and kind of portraying that passion for why is it, you know, because this is hard work and the, it's the why that keeps you going. Um, so I think activating that why in, in staff and buildings is going to be really important and something that we really wholeheartedly want to want to be able to do. Um, and we'll strive for open, transparent interactions um, and more of a feedback loop instead of distri distribution of just information. So like I said, this is ongoing work. Those are very initial ideas of, um, you know, specific things that emerge within those uh, takeaway areas. Um, but we're going to funnel that down further and come to consensus on so then you know, what do we do about it and how does it look? Um, but we'll keep you informed as the work unfolds and um, thank you for your time. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa. Um, yeah, question for me and then uh, I'm sure others have questions too. So this baseline data, the survey that you did is a rich data source. Are you planning to do this on an annual basis to see how we are improving? And, yeah. and, and I know you've got a lot of work around um, action planning and that kind of thing. I'd be curious, you know, how when you go about that of your taking specific actions to try to improve the survey results next time around? Yes. Um, we had talked about, this was done in Qualtrics and um, with Kristen even originally, we had talked about something that we could potentially repeat over time to use it as um, formative information. Mm -hmm. are, we, are, we, are we improving, you know, in these areas over time? Um, and also, I think just for, you know, just for that ongoing planning, like I said, right now we'll have a formal communication plan, but that needs to be a living document. It needs to be live, that as we get more information back, we go back into it and say we either are or aren't getting to where, where we want to be. So we will have to have some sta stable data points over time. Mm -hmm. And this is one that is realistic to do that with. Yeah, yeah. it's a very, it's a nice baseline yes. to work from. It's good. Yeah, and thanks for getting that data together. It, it really helps to be able to look at that and be able to go back and look at that. So I appreciate that. Um, you talked about kind of more collaboration between gen ed and special ed. And time, obviously, is the thing. So are there ideas? Like, where do we get that time? Or what, what can we, you know, because I think it's worth, I really think it's worth it in the long run, you know, to, to have that collaboration. I just think that's all, in my opinion, a piece that's, really been missing is that that collaboration and that really it's it's not just the special ed teacher's job to it, to provide services it's everybody's job so I wonder if yeah what are the ideas for where we can get some some more time for collaboration you know we and again um, I haven't matched uh, hatched this master plan by myself because I don't think it's appropriate for me to do that by myself but I can tell you that some comments that I've heard over time and even very recently even as recently as today um, indicate that some people are put, putting it together that, hey, we have time, it's just how we're using it. And right now, we're using it separately. We've been using it separately. Um, special education is threaded throughout every single thing we do in the district. Um, our special education students are gen ed students first. Um, so 
instead of seeing it separately, separate time, separate PD, separate, separate, we think, how can we take the rest of the existing program and infuse and thread our special education people and services right into that? So a good example of that is one, today we had, um, uh, we had some professional learning going on with our principals, uh, specifically about special education, which was wonderful, but one of the principals said to me, you know, now that we have more control uh, over the professional learning time in our buildings, um, which I just spoke to the curriculum department sending out a survey and so forth, um, she said, I think we, we could use some of that for our collaboration time between gen ed special ed because some of our gen ed teachers would be including be more inclusive if they knew how to be it's almost like our you know we have to we just have to use that for some new learning um, between our special ed and, and gen ed so i thought that was a good connection to make we have time it's how are we using it right now um, we've used it separately so we will not use it separately anymore great i'm excited to see how that how that pans out and what happens. Yep. Yeah. It's a shared responsibility. Other questions? Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it very much. Look forward to the next update. Um, up next, we have legislative priorities. Um, did you want to talk about this, Steve? Sure. Or? Just uh, there was a question uh, about uh, boy, it seems awful early since we just seems like we just finished the last <laughs> session. Uh, but uh, just a reminder that uh, one of the things that ISB does during this downtime in the legislative session is they begin to build their legislative platform. Uh, they like theirs to reflect uh, those issues that are most important to the school districts throughout the state, uh, and so they ask us as a board uh, to reflect. Uh, on what we think will be our legislative priorities moving forward. Um, so for you as a board, this doesn't mean that you have to have everything finalized when we leave today. Uh, but if you have uh, areas of concentration that you think that you'd like to focus on in the next uh, legislative session, this gives us the opportunity to report that back uh, to the Iowa Association of School Boards. So one of the attachments that's on there is our legislative brochure uh, from last year. Um, certainly our expectation is not that we have that in finalized form when we leave here tonight. Uh, but again, if you have areas of focus uh, that you think that we uh, collectively as a board and a community want to look at as we move forward in working with our legislators in the upcoming session, that's the kind of information that we'd like to be able to report out to the ISB when we're done today. So I'm wondering if this is a good work session topic for our next meeting. At the or no? It could be, with the exception of the fact that they want their information no later than, Kim, August, August 10. 1. August 10. August 10. So August 10. Okay. So right. we added, added this, as, and the reason I'm suggesting that is because I think um, if the board would be open to it, having um, the ICEA co-presidents be part of that conversation, Certainly. Mr. Brady, uh, at least it would, if there's openness to that, I'd like to at least extend the invitation. Absolutely. Um, because if they have so much additional insight, I think, that could help us in terms of forming our priorities. And um, uh, that might be a little more a workable discussion and give us a little bit more time to think through the priorities and bring that to the, the, the next work session on the whatever the next meeting is, the 24th. Absolutely. That, does that seem reasonable, other folks? I, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself. I, I, for legislative priorities, mine are going to be very simple and pretty direct and almost all about money. <laughs> frank, I mean, just to be frank, I just yeah. think that's the, the big missing piece. It's, it's, it's what we need. It's what holds us back at, at every step of the way. It's a decade of underfunding education. and so. You know, the simpler the message can be and the more people that get behind it. I mean, that, that's rather than get all drawn out in lots of little things, I know that's where I'm going to be coming from. So. And just so that I understand, they're, they're asking, ISB is asking us to pick one, four of their identified priorities and say these are the priorities for Iowa City School District? Uh, you can do that. You can also simply report your priorities okay. to them. All right. Yes. Okay. Which is what we've done in the past. Okay, good. And I'd be willing to do that after we have the discussion, um, since I'm their delegate, and attend the, uh, the meeting they have in, fall, in the fall, or at least did last year. Is our delegate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only caution I'd have, it's the Brian Kirschling rule. Uh, as you report the, uh, our priorities, there are two places to report them. He inadvertently reported them in the wrong place. Kim can help you with that uh, so that you don't wind up on the floor of the delegate assembly explaining our priorities <laughs> to the rest of the delegates across the state. Okay. 
Right. So that was an error that we learned from. <laughs> we can thank Brian for that. He didn't realize that when he got there and they called him out and said, please explain your priorities. And he called me in a panic and said, what do I do now? Oh, that's so funny. We'll try to avoid that with you. Yeah, I think that's fair. So if, if that's okay, when we do an agenda setting for next board meeting, we can add this as, an, as a topic to our work session. Fair enough? And invite the ICEA co-presidents. Very good, thank you. Um, next up, calendar update, Kingsley. So, um, try to be brief, and I'll share this memory with you that uh, intern Rachel, Rachel Maller put together. Um, but basically, this is just an update to the discussion and the brief kind of um, board discussion that happened on February 13th. There was a lot of community involvement. And so, we, we're going to share with you kind of our findings and some more information as far as next steps. So, I have Rachel Maller, she is our um, equity intern, and also Sasha. Sasha Chapnik Sorokin. Close. That's, uh, that's, uh, let's try and hard. Hello. Okay, yeah. Hi, everybody. Okay, so our district is not the first one to have this conversation, and we're not going to be the last. As communities all over the country, including our own, continue to grow in diversity, um, school leaders like yourselves are faced with the challenge of accommodating students with different religions. So today we're going to talk to you guys about the background, why we're here um, talking about this, what we currently do to accommodate students, a survey that we did, um, and next steps that we're going to be taking. So if you all can remember back to February, um, a group of elementary students came and talked to the board and asked them to think about taking Muslim holidays off um, of Eid, similar to what we do for Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving. They expressed that um, it's unfair for them to have the choice to have to pick. So schools currently cannot um, legally close for religious reasons, but they can do so for a secular reason, such as high absenteeism. So right now our policy is that students get an excused absence for um, a religious holiday, and it doesn't go on their attendance record, but lots of religious holidays that aren't Christian, we still have school. Um, so students can also be exempt from class if it interferes with um, what their religion follows, and then buildings will accommodate those students. If they're observing a holiday, for example, students who observe Ramadan, um, in PE class there should be accommodations made if they're fasting so they don't have to have as much physical exertion. So a few months ago um, we did a survey to the consultation of religious communities here in Iowa City. Yes, thanks. And so um, the respondents said a majority of them said to take Christmas, Christmas Eve off. 19% um, said to take all holidays off, 15% Easter and Good Friday, 12% Yom Kippur, 8% Rosh Hashanah, and 4% Eid, and 4% said none. And we also went and had a meeting with the consultation and talked to them openly, and they were really um, pleased that we were actually bringing this up and the district was thinking about this. Some open-ended comments, um, they said that they would value closures on holy days of other religions and would actively support changes in the calendar to accommodate. And somebody else said um, to please pay attention to Muslim, Hindu, Baha'i, and other faith traditions as well. So this isn't just a problem or a relevant topic in our district. Um, other school districts have faced this. So some with significant Muslim po populations have closed to avoid this high absenteeism. These include Cambridge, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Dearborn, Michigan, Montgomery County, Maryland, Patterson, South Brunswick, New Jersey, Waterbury, Connecticut, and New York, New York. Um, so there have other, also been other groups who have pushed for taking school off. These include Jewish students and Hindu students. And so when they choose to, when school districts choose to take school off for religious holidays, there are two reasons. Um, one of them is numbers, which we've talked about. So if there will be a high number of students or teachers who are absent because they're celebrating the holiday, that it wouldn't make sense to have school anyway, then schools can choose to cancel school that day. But it can also be um, on the basis of values. So it could be in terms of celebrating diversity as that is something the school district values. So embracing pluralism. 
Yeah, so there are kind of four options that we found when we're doing research. Like she said, the first one was a purely numbers consideration. So the um, pro to that is that it's a secular basis for schools to make a determination, but there's not a consistent number that everybody says is the standard number to decide when. So school districts make their own determination on what is enough, what's a significant amount of people to call the day off. Um, again, like she said, the second one is about values, and so school districts in Maryland voted to close schools for two Jewish holidays, Eid, Lunar New Year, um, and the reason was to be inclusive and of all religions and cultures. And then a third option is to make no changes to the calendar and just accommodate students, and that's what we're doing right now, and that's what most school districts do across the country. And another option that's a little more controversial is removing all the names of any religious holidays on the calendar. Um, in Maryland, 14 schools actually did this. Um, they use secular terms like winter holiday, spring break, um, to be able to have a secularism for calling it off. And a lot of it had to do with there was a lot of conflict in the community, and so to kind of appease everyone, they just kind of said, we'll just not do any, name any holidays. But it wasn't totally effective. So. Yeah. <laughs> so the next steps we have determined are um, figuring out a process to determine which holy days we find most important for school calendar closures, and then also gathering data on the religious demographics of our school district, both in teachers and students. Um, and administrators. Then third, we would make a timeline for policy design, approval, and implementation. And then finally, we would implement a policy that is fair and inclusive to all members of our district, regardless of their religious observance. Do you guys have any questions? We'll try our best to answer them. And if not, we can always refer to Kingsley. Just a quick question. Uh, thank you for the work and the first steps that you were able to provide tonight with your presentation. Um, as far as your next steps, um, number one and number two, do, do you have a timeline for those two steps? When you will um, try and tackle those, will it be this upcoming school year, fall? Yeah, so it won't be this upcoming school year because the calendar's already, um, already been done for the school year. I think ultimately uh, one of the things that we wanted to do that just with scheduling didn't happen, wanted to meet with the rabbi, wanted to meet with the imam, just to talk with them as far as what are the days, holy days in particular, that we need to be considering and thinking about. Um, we were going to go that way first, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't missing any religion. So that's why we went to the consultation of religious communities and asked that question. So that hasn't happened yet. I hope to have that conversation within the next week or so, um, just to make sure I can give you that update or give Steve that update to share with you later on. Um, and then go from there as far as, not necessarily this year, we would continue with the option three, which would be accommodating, um, not only with the, you know, scheduling situations or obviously classes and other things, but ultimately if there could be changes for the following year, um, that could be something to consider. As you know, many of the um, holy days in particular religions follow the Luther cal calendar, and so, it doesn't necessarily mean that those will be the same holy days um, or religious observances that need to happen on a regular basis. Remind me when we set the calendar for the uh, 1920 school year, or is that already set? Is it the 20, so it's the 2021 school year that we're talking about? What we do is we bring you three years at a time, but we bring you three years each year yeah. so that if there's a need to make an adjustment for a subsequent year, we're able to do that. So you as a board have the opportunity every year to review the next three years calendars and make then. appropriate What's adjustments. What's the time frame for that again? What time of year? We like to bring that to you in September. So we've, that's your point. We've missed it right. for this next cycle, but um, we, we want to do the work so that we have the inputs that we need in the decision-making policy, whatever, before we have that review cycle in September next year. Right. Okay. On your survey, um, I didn't see where it says uh, how, many how many actual participants there were. In the survey? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we just had about like, 10 to 15 responses, and the majority of them were Christians. 10 to 15? 15. 15 respondents okay. in the survey. It was given to the leaders of religious communities, They're, so just people that are considered leaders in the community. Oh, okay. Then Kingsley, on our calendar, we don't call out any specific holidays besides Martin Luther King Jr. holiday and Thanksgiving holiday, correct? Um, yes, but we do have a calendar right under that calendar that speaks to um, multiple faiths. And so that's just at, at times it's at the request, we just try to put that on there. It really helps schools in particular make sure they're not scheduling uh, major events in relation to those um, holy days. 
maybe a, for clarification for you, for our staff. So our public facing calendar either indicates we have school or no school, uh, but then we maintain a very detailed calendar of religious holidays. Uh, Kingsley's worked really hard to make sure that that uh, calendar is updated on an annual basis um, so that all of our building principals have access to that and understand how that interfaces um, with our school no school day calendar so they understand when there may be holidays that are taking place where we do uh, have students in session. Other questions? Thank you all so much for the presentation. Appreciate it and your work. It's fantastic. Um, Kingsley, you're up again. So as many of you know, there's been many comments made about the work that we're doing around LGBTQ inclusion in our school environment. I know there's been a, a, a really huge focus on the curriculum, but I do want to make sure that um, that's been misstated. I mean, we're ultimately looking at the entire environment um, because, as we know, we're not just focused on um, just the curriculum we're talking about our kids, especially from historically marginalized populations. So just a quick overview. Um, you know. Not too long ago, the board made a statement into this effect that was approved in April, focusing on talking about how it's important for us to make sure that we have an environment free of discrimination, especially for our LGBTQ plus students. Um, in general, because we know what the data says, and it's, it's been pretty clear, not only across um, multiple research background and guidelines, but also within policies and other things that, you know, suicide rate is ridiculously high for our, our, our LGBTQ plus students. Um, the rate of bullying and other things is ridiculously high. We have to do better, we need to do better. And some of these steps I hope will prevent or provide a, a more open environment. So in general, one of the things that I'm, I'm really excited about, and when I say I, I, I do wanna clarify, this is a part of a collective effort um, with um, a steering committee. Not only the work that was done with the Student Climate Survey brief, the Student Climate Survey LGBTQ multi-stakeholder task force that focused on LGBTQ initiatives, but also the steering committee that's comprised of counselors, teachers, Dr. Bruck as well, um, to ensure that it's not just me focusing on these things, that these are you know, dedicated people in their professions wanting to see better for our students. In general, we wanted to put together a gender support plan. So one of the things I'm focused on, especially now, is capacity and making sure that the information doesn't necessarily reside with one person or one department. This gender support plan provides all the information that normally I have in the meetings when we're talking about a student transitioning or um, either from out of the district or when I say transitioning, a student that has transitioned that's coming into the district or a student that is um, transition, who has transition is moving to another school in our district to make sure we have a gender support plan that focuses on key areas of different facets of what the school environment will look like for that particular student. Um, and I'll we'll talk about some of those key pieces later on, but it, it's to provide, again, a different structure. And so normally I would come to those meetings, we'd have that conversation with the parents involved, we walk through that guideline, but now there's a plan that will provide some professional development to our nurses, our student family advocates, and our counselors as far as being the leaders in this work moving forward. The other piece of this is reviewing policies to protect student privacy and looking at the CUNE folder and what we can do. Um, working with Craig, I really appreciate his expertise and focusing on changing some of the, the language as it relates to our CUNE folder, so removing gender and ultimately, while we have to put the, um, the legal name on the document, we can also have the preferred name added on there as well in parentheses. And so that's a change that I think, again, is there to help and assist in um, our students, or for our students. And then greater visibility on our website. And so in general, we have a tab that you can see there that provides a wealth of different resources, supports, basic rights for LGBTQ students. So there's a clear understanding of their rights within schools, but also um, for any teachers or parents or community members that are also interested in what we're trying to do to make sure we have a more welcoming community. One of the things that has been discussed since I've gotten here is training, 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 training over and over again. And it's been tough because things have shifted. And as we've talked about, or um, Director Claussen has talked about not too recently, there's been some changes in funding. Uh, transformative healing um, has been significantly cut. RVAP has been significantly cut. And these are organizations um, that have 
been in the kiln mm -hmm. as far as being interested in helping us with this effort and just haven't been able to because things have shifted and priorities have shifted. I'm, I'm happy to work with Dr. Brooke and um, she's reached out to the, the professors for the Gender and Women's Studies um, that are really are going to put a, a really comprehensive focus on not only gender equity but sexual equity um, as well or se sexual identity and gender identity um, in our our professional development days. And so we have an optional day on August 17th and we have a mandatory day October 5th that we're going to offer this to our teachers to be able to take. So really excited about this effort because I know our teachers, I remember when we served last time, and that was maybe two years ago, over 200 teachers were interested in learning more and having more information towards this work. And so we will have that available to them some way, some shape, and some form. Oops. Curriculum, which has been a focus of a lot of the last board meetings. And so I want to make sure that I'm clear. Uh, for me, this has been a, a, a conversation more from a multicultural and gender fair framework. So I know there's a, a clear focus on why are we specifically talking about LGBTQ students. That's never been the case. I mean, we've focused on it just because of the brief that came out that we saw that we were deficient in discussing why or in discussing a representation around our LGBTQ students, but it's never been something that we haven't incorporated within our multicultural and gender fair framework from the start, and that will continue. And so ultimately what we're looking at is again, not only making sure that students can see themselves in the curriculum, but even when we're talking about math problems and we make math problems that says mom and dad, and, and we'd make those things, again, consciously thinking about how we practiced them before, we can change some of those examples and word problems that we use and different scenarios that we use to be more encompassing of all different identities. And again, the, the school districts that are moving forward in this way, you see their student climate survey information, you know, move up the chart in, in that regard because they are incorporating more from that curriculum standpoint. So I, I remember uh, having a phone call, and I'll be brief because this is a brief story. I remember having a phone call not too long ago um, asking me, you know, well, you know, from an LGBTQ standpoint, what are you going to do? I mean, are you going to incorporate in the curriculum? What if we, what if we don't want to have it in the curriculum? And my, my question to that is, it would be the same question I would ask for, if, if the same answer or response would be for Martin Luther King. You know, ultimately, we are trying to ensure that we have our leaders, especially our students, um, as global leaders in society. They need to have a wide-ranging background to deal with not only Iowa, um, but across the nation, across the, um, across the world. And so. Um, that's what we're about. And again, that only speaks to our mission statement, but I think that's something that I've really focused on since I've been here day one. And so that's what this is about. Again, we're working through that anti-bias framework to really move that conversation forward, not just for LGBTQ plus students, but multicultural and gender fair across the board as well. Uh, one of the other components of this is inclusive school environment. It's focused on bathrooms. And so I know I shared with you um, at the last, or not the last board education, committee meeting, but one prior, um, that, you know, anecdotal conversations with students, you know, students felt uncomfortable that their ability to harass in the bathroom, that they would literally go the entire day without using the bathroom. That's ridiculous. It's not a school climate that I think anybody is supportive of. And so as we're thinking about these things, we are looking at and identifying restrooms that can transition. Um, we have restrooms already currently in our school buildings. They have been successful. Um, a lot of these are single stall restrooms. Again, that is the best practice when it comes to when you're focusing on, you know, elementary schools especially. Um, some of these changes have already occurred and uh, there's been a lot of concern and focus on, you know, well, why are we just doing it for this population? And it's so interesting to me because I always use a motto, what's best for some is always good for all. Because when we make those changes, one of the things that's happened in one of our elementary schools is that it's actually helped provide a little more uh, or lessen the pressure that's happened right after recess because there's an extra bathroom that people can go to. And so those are the considerations that don't necessarily get discussed and talked about, but those are the things that happen when you make these kind of changes. It's the same arguments that people made about the ADA, but I guarantee you if you have a handful and you move your butt and hit that button real quick to open the door for yourself, I mean, that's a part of what, we, what, is, what was first thought of as far as something that was just focused on some, it's ultimately good for all. So I urge you in thinking about that as we make these changes and these shifts to be thinking about how this again is good for all and not just again focused on some. Sorry for using the word but. Last but not least, next steps. Um, to continue to campaign to educate the community. I think that in general, um, as we're working through this, 
Um, and I know we were giving you updates. We haven't necessarily focused on that educational campaign, which is so important. And the school districts that have done this work have focused primarily on the educational piece. But we knew that the work needed to get done quickly. We knew that there were things happening right away that we needed to change. And so we'll work on that piece. I'll have, I've been working on a, a plan with Steve as far as what that will look like and how that will be rolled out as well. Train staff on a gender support plan so they have that information as well. And then continue work with LGBTQ plus steering committee to maintain progress on the roadmap as well. Again, this is not just about me or the equity department. Again, it's, I think it's something that flows, as Lisa talked about before, something that flows throughout all of our departments and things that we need to do. And I've been you know, blessed with the support of staff um, and blessed with the support of team to focus on this effort. Questions? Thanks, Kingsley. I have a couple of just quick questions Two. Um, or, or maybe comments. Um, when the safe stone slides came up, it just reminded me of our education committee meeting and, and some of the students there that said, you know, it's great to see that there's a staff willing to do the safe zone training or get trained, but sometimes they feel like the sticker just goes up on the door, but maybe there's not some follow up. So I think it's great that we're doing the training, but we need to make sure we are following up with those teachers and staff to make sure that's, you know, working and it is a true safe zone for those students. Uh, and then the second um, point was on the uh, inclusive school environments, you specifically stated bathrooms. Has there been any, any discussion to looking into locker room um, usage? Yeah, in general, our, our policy, um, which I'll be trying to really finalize and make sure is codified, our internal policy has always been that individuals um, choose the bathroom corresponding with their gender identity. And so that's been the policy for the last three years. And so ultimately, that hasn't necessarily been an issue. And when there has been concerns and questions, we've walked through that. That's a part of that gender support plan that removes myself from the equation. Not saying that the director of equity wouldn't have some type of role, but ultimately some of that capacity will be left at the building level to be answering those questions. And so that isn't so much of an issue from that standpoint. But that's also why those inclusive restrooms are important, because in many of our kids don't even like to dress in the, um, the locker room. They use the, restrooms in, or they use the restrooms instead. So having those inclusive restrooms also provides an opportunity for people to dress for PE or other activities. Do we have any, uh, in our locker rooms, do we have any sort of more private stalls where kids can dress? I mean, I know that's a thing that some districts are doing to kind of get around some of this, is just make it in the locker room, all the locker rooms, make it more private for everybody. To date, I don't think we've focused on the locker rooms. We have been providing restrooms, and we have been doing a little research. We've actually looked into our European model uh, with restroom stalls. It gives a lot of privacy, so we're try going to try and incorporate that. Okay. But, but as we go through the next round of design, we'll certainly focus on that. Yeah, I know, um, you know, I went to a conference recently, and that, so since 2007, this has been the code of Iowa, that you can use the restroom the corresponding with your identity. And I, I know that most districts are way behind, you know, um, implementing that. Uh, but that was the guidance from the Department of Ed, if, because the question comes up, well, if your one student is uncomfortable, well, what if my six students are uncomfortable changing with that one student and the Department of Ed's guidance is then you find somewhere else for those other six students because we're not going to infringe on someone's rights um, and that's the code. And so I know that was the lawyer from the Department of Ed is certainly uh, was very clear in his opinion about how that should be implemented. And um, so I, I really appreciate that we're uh, going down this road and looking at, at all this. Yeah, and Director Klaassen, I would say also the reason why I don't think it's as much of an issue and I, I really, you know, it's unfortunate that students aren't here the students are well beyond where we are. I mean, we're, we're catching up to their understanding and their conversation and their discussion in relation to this issue. And so, you know, it, there was an issue that happened in one of our high schools. The students were able to work through, those, I mean, work through that situation really quickly and have more of a conversation and education about why this was important. And so it's, it's been not, it hasn't been an issue. Yeah, I'd point out that we're starting year four uh, of this practice, and uh, obviously as a board, you know, you, some of you may have been unaware of that, and I think that's a true testament to the students in the school and the way that they've adopted this and made sure that it works for all kids. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? 
I would like to say thank you, Kingsley, for all of your service on this particular project, but also all of the work that you've done in your role as equity director, and want to wish you well in your new role. And uh, I'm not sure exactly when the transition is going to happen, but um, thank you for everything you've done. It's This is just one example of um, how you've moved the needle in the district, so I wanted to say thank you for that. Appreciate it. Okay, up next, um, Safety Advisory Committee Board Representative. This is um, an item just to note that um, Paul's been appointed. Um, I appointed Paul. We had two uh, volunteers, Phil and Paul, and um, given representation on various committees um, uh, that, that both Phil and, and is, is doing great work on the uh, playground committee, et cetera. Um, I felt it was good to have another director um, participate on the safety committee, and so this was just an acknowledgement of that assignment. Any comments or questions on that? Moving on, um, would any directors like to comment on their uh, liaison reports? Most of us didn't get our items uh, in. <laughs> uh, I will just make two quick comments. Uh, Phil and I both attended the groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, for the student build house and, and maybe Phil might want to comment more on it, but uh, there's a lot of people there and it was it was a good event and um, they were already they were already building by the time we weren't really breaking the ground it was already uh, being built by the time we had got there and then also just uh, circle back on your safety committee um, comment we have had two meetings already and I think the group that was put together is a really good group and um, it's uh, a large topic that we're trying to narrow down and uh, we're, I think we're getting there. It's been, it's been uh, a good group to, to work with so far. So I think we're gonna see some positive things come out of that. Um, I just wanted to comment on the uh, city council meeting. I did go and speak in favor of their annexation policy as well as Paul. Um, and although all council members uh, were very supportive of it. They did not officially vote on it that night because they wanted some langu language change and did not want that to happen at the table and or without some input um, from the commission. So it's my understanding that will be brought back to them at their next meeting where it should be voted on and passed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to, uh, I, I didn't get my liaison report in and, and uh, uh, with that home building uh, uh, project over on the east side of town, um, there was a tremendous amount of, uh, of community interest. Um, the governor was there, two state uh, senators, uh, maybe some more public officials than I'm than than I'm uh, uh, than I recollect. recollect. Uh, but uh, it's a phenomenal opportunity, and and um, I. I uh, we have two students from our district participating in it, uh, which there were many more openings. Um, so uh, I, uh, I feel that, you know, uh, personally, I didn't get an, do enough uh, advertising to get it out there, even though I spent a half an hour on the radio and, and, uh, and did as, uh, what I, I thought was sufficient. But uh, we've got to make sure that uh, the community is aware when these opportunities are out there. Um, you know, having the governor come to a student build in our own community is significant, and uh, and that, and uh, it's a it's a great project put on by the Home Building Association, and uh, uh, all those all those people, and it's, it's a great addition to our community. So hopefully, it it is something that continues on in the future, and and there'll be more opportunities for our students that way. Also, I did meet with some uh, community uh, ag leaders uh, concerning uh, FFA. Uh, curriculum and opportunities to get the word out on that. Uh, uh, Senator Kinney was in on that conversation as well and uh, uh, some ag, ag leaders and uh, one uh, community member has already uh, informed me he's donating to uh, the FFA uh, chapter and that so I think we've got some opportunities of the community to, to share and help us with this programming. Thank you. Any other updates? If not, we'll move to agenda setting for the 24th. Um, first up will be an exempt session to discuss the superintendent contract. Um, for the actual board meeting, it's uh, right now extremely light. And I don't know if there's other topics that we want to slot in, but we do have a work session scheduled and we might want to save our time for that. 
Um, right now, our, our meeting on the 24th is a consent agenda. The only thing I would say that we could consider, and it depends on how the work session goes tonight, but if, if um, we do end up making a change to the 3J6 policy that um, maybe we would want to vote on it at that point, but it depends on how the work session goes. Okay, so we'll pin that and uh, decide what happens. Um, so, uh, light. Can I just make one more suggestion? Oh, please, go ahead, please. Uh, just in, maybe in light of what Phil said about the community member that's uh, looking to donate to the FFA, maybe it would be worth a discussion um, to look into maybe uh, how we could set up something similar for ag that we have like for the boosters or the music auxiliary where there's a specific exactly. group yep that's uh, responsible for fundraising for that and it's not just I've, i have had some discussions with matt already on on that and and uh, matt was uh, invited to this meeting but was unable to attend but uh, yes that's the, we're we're looking to have a model sim similar to that exactly and if it's fundraising should we not also involve the foundation yeah, so we'll complete a fundraising request form is uh, generally our process to start there. And then depending on the size and scale, uh, we work that through the foundation. So uh, we've had some initial conversations with Susan. We'll get something similar sent up. Um, I know other districts have done something similar, like a Friends of FFA or, you know, something along those lines. So depending on if it's curricular needs or if it's more the extracurricular portion of the ag program with FFA, will kind of guide some of our work there. But I know... Uh, Director Hemingway has been talking to a lot of community members about doing that, so we'll work through our normal process on that and make sure we get set up right. Okay, good. Thank you. And, and with, with FFA, uh, since we're starting from scratch, uh, districts that have already had it for many years, they have, the FFA has created their own alumni, associate, uh, alumni uh, chapters, which fundraise and things to help support the existing chapters. So. Uh, there, there, there will be many things with this going forward that uh, will give us some opportunities. Um, I, we did receive an email from a uh, student concerning uh, fees, fees for AP uh, courses and that, and at some point I, I spoke with this student and uh, I don't know if that's something we could put on an agenda at some point in time to have a discussion on that as far as uh, uh, yeah, before you do that, let me send you just a quick response back. I responded back to the student, looked okay. into it a little bit, so I'll send you a, a memo in regards to that. So you've, all right. Yeah. That I was just, if, if that's something that uh, we've clarified and, and everything that way, if that could be shared publicly with, with more than one, just that one student, I think that'd be good. Yeah, thanks, Kingsley. Um, I would just add, if the safety committee's met twice, I don't know how often you're meeting, and I don't know at what point they're ready to make recommendations, but if there's at least yeah. kind of an update of what you've talked about. Well, there's a plan. We have three more meetings before we will come back to you with uh, short-term recommendations. Do we want to wait until then to do anything? Okay. Yep. So you'll let us know, Paul, when it's ready for board topic. Okay, very good. Um, so then we'll have a work session on the 24th. Our main topic is going to be the attendance area work, but we've also, I think, agreed to add the legislative priorities onto that work session on the 24th. Anything else? Hearing none, mm -hmm. move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.